Hello again. Now if you've been watching my channel, you'll know that over the last few years I've been gradually pimping my Acorn Electron. First I added an Elk SD64 to give me an SD card interface and avoid needing to use tapes. Then I replaced it with an Acorn Plus One expansion box, and added Elk SD Plus One and Advanced Tube Interface cartridges for extra sideways RAM and second processor support. And finally, I added an AP6 version 2 inside the Plus One to add some extra sideways ROM and RAM banks. But about a year ago, I bought one of Roland Lur's Elk Econet cartridges um, for the Plus One, which is great, but unfortunately I've got no slots free in mind, so to use it I'm either going to have to lose the SD card interface or the tube interface. So time for another purchase from Dave Hitchens, um, and today we're going to have a look at the new Advanced Plus Five, which combines some of the functionality of these two cartridges onto one single cartridge, as well as adding some other features of its own, and that'll hopefully let me use the Elk Econet at the same time. The AP5 aims to add to the Electron with a plus one most of the interfaces you'd find on a BBC Micro. Starting on the left is a mostly BBC compatible 1 MHz bus interface, which can support a hard disk, Music 5000 or numerous other things. Moving round to the top, there are two user ports for attaching things like mice or other external input output devices. The one on the right, port B, is BBC compatible, although the I.O. is mapped to a different address in memory. In particular though, it supports the BBC Turbo SD card interface, compatible with a special Electron build of MMFS, and this should allow me to replace the Elk SD Plus One. An addition on the new AP5 over the original is the second user port, port A on the left, which has some limitations that it doesn't support the shift register in the 6522 via, so you can't use it with the SD card interface. And finally on the right, you have a BBC compatible tube port for attaching a second processor, including the Pi Tube Direct, so that should provide most of the functionality of the advanced tube interface cartridge. The new AP5 also has a couple of headers on the back, accessible through a small slot, a 4-pin I2C connector and a UPERS interface, which is a high-speed file transfer system for moving files between a BBC or Electron and a PC host over a special serial cable. Removing the rear cover of the AP5, we have access to three ROM sockets. The leftmost socket is for bank 13, which is a high priority sideways bank on the Electron. This can be switched in slightly quicker than banks with numbers under 8, so is best reserved for things that need it, like Econet ROMs. The other two sockets are for sideways ROM and RAM chips. The banks they occupy depend on which socket on the plus one you insert the AP5. In the rear slot it's bank 0 and 1, and in the front slot 2 and 3. On the new AP5, however, things are a little more complicated. It adds a number of modes, controllable by jumpers J1 and J2, to control how the sideways sockets are mapped into memory. Mode 0 is the most obvious configuration. Each socket contains a single 16K ROM and they are mapped to the corresponding banks. You can also use 32K ROMs and swap between the halves using a command provided in the Enhanced Plus One support ROM. Mode 1 is very similar except you only need a single 32k chip in the rightmost socket. The first 16k is mapped to the lower bank and the second 16k to the higher bank. Again you can use a 64k ROM and swap between the two sets of ROMs using the support ROM command. Mode 2 is more complicated and is useful for people who want to run MMFS. You put a 32k RAM chip in the middle socket and a 32k ROM chip in the rightmost socket. It then maps the first 13.5k of the ROM and 2.5k of the RAM into the lower bank, and the top 16k of the ROM is mapped to the higher bank. This lets you use the version of MMFS in the lower bank which stores its workspace in the spare space at the top of the sideways RAM bank, and avoids raising page from the hex EOO. You can then put any other 16k ROM in the higher bank, and again you can use a 64k ROM and swap between the halves with a command. Finally, Mode 3 is similar to Mode 2 but for the special Prez version of ADFS that keeps page at hex E100, and again needs a combination of a 32k RAM chip in the middle socket and a 32k ROM in the rightmost socket. It just changes the addresses everything is mapped to to support ADFS E00, whose ROM is split over both halves of the 32k. I'm going to use MMFS with my AP5, so I've got a 32K62256 RAM chip in the middle ROM02 socket and a 32K28256 EEPROM in the right hand ROM13 socket. To write the EEPROM, I need to first set the jumpers for mode 1, J1 closed and J2 open, so that I can access the whole 32K of the EEPROM without the RAM getting in the way. I'll also set J5 to allow writes to the chip in the ROM13 socket. 
With the AP5 configured, I can insert it alongside my ELK SD plus one, which I'm going to use to load the software to reprogram the EEPROM. To program, first I need to unlock ROM Bank 0. Then I can use Virtual Disk 10 on the ELK SD plus one's MMFS where I've prepared the software, and use the EE load utility to write the ESW MMFS ROM image into the EEPROM in Bank 0. After it's complete, I can press Control Break to reset the electron and confirm it's been loaded correctly. To see it in action, we need to remove the AP5 and set the jumpers back to MMFS Mode 2, with the ROM 1.3 writes disabled. Then we can reinsert the AP5 and remove the ELK SD plus 1, and add a Turbo MMC unit into user port B, same as you'd use in a BBC Micro. On power-up we can see the MMFS SW RAM Turbo Sideways ROM has loaded OK and confirm that page is still at hex E100, so we're not using main memory for the filing system workspace. We can then check the RAM in the AP5 is working OK by trying to access the card, first by listing all the virtual disks, and then by booting something up and giving it a quick test. OK, so we've got MMFS loaded up into one of the sideways ROM banks in the AP5, but we've still got that other free sideways uh, bank in there. Now, I could install anything I want, but it would make sense to put something in there that's useful when I install the AP5 in the Electron. So what I'm thinking about doing is using the uh, 1 MHz bus socket on the left-hand side of the AP5 to attach a Pi 1 MHz, a bit like I do on the BBC. Now, this can pretend to be a variety of things, but I particularly want it to be a SCSI hard disk that I can use with ADFS. There are various versions of ADFS for the Electron. Acon developed the original 1.00 version, but that had a couple of major bugs. The first of which is that it can't write to the first few tracks of a floppy reliably, and the second is that Star Compact can corrupt the disk as it uses the screen as a temporary buffer and the flashing cursor messes things up. After Acorn lost interest in the Electron, development was taken over by Prez, who promptly fixed those bugs. The later versions keep page at EOO, same as tape, but need two sideways banks with overlaid RAM, which is what Mode 3 on the AP5 supports, but I'd have to give up MMFS for that. But the real killer on the Prez versions is that they drop support for SCSI hard disks, and so the only contemporary version I can use is 1.00. I don't really like the idea of those bugs though. Acorn did, however, develop later versions of ADFS for the BBC Micro, including 1.30. This fixed the floppy track bug, but it didn't need to fix the Star Compact bug because the BBC has a hardware cursor and isn't affected by it. It also doesn't work on the Electron because the hardware I.O. addresses are different. Fortunately, David Banks has disassembled ADFS 1.30 for the BBC and patched it with the I.O. addresses on the Electron. The Star Compact problem I fixed by modifying the code to disable and re-enable the flashing cursor around the command, and I've called this tweaked version 1.30e. So with that, we've got a version of ADFS that runs on the Electron with the two major bugs fixed and hard disk support. I've still got Page at 1 DOO, but that doesn't particularly matter to me as I'm usually on a tube processor with its own memory space when I'm using ADFS. So now I can set the jumpers to enable programming of the EEPROM and use the ELK SD plus one again to run the EE load utility to write the ADFS 1.30e filing system ROM into sideways bank one. I can't use the new MMFS in the AP5 because it won't have the workspace RAM mapped in when the jumpers are set for writing to the EEPROM. Once we've got that sorted, I can put the jumpers back to MMFS mode 2 and insert my vintage Prez AP3 floppy disk interface cartridge in the plus one's rear slot and the new AP5 in the front slot. The Pi 1 MHz virtual hard disk connects to the 1 MHz bus port on the left hand side of the AP5 and needs a separate USB power connection. Then we can turn everything on, starting with my GoTech virtual floppy drive and finishing with the Electron itself. In the startup messages, we can see Acorn ADFS is present and the boot filing system. I also have a Prez ADFS ROM in my AP3, so it appears in bank one. And it's probably a good idea to disable this with star unplug to avoid having two ADFSs lurking about. After a control break, we can catalog the Pi 1 MHz hard disk, which is drive zero, the default and then we can switch to drive 4, the GoTek virtual floppy drive. We can test out the star compact fix on the floppy by creating some free space at the start of the disk, and then compacting it to shuffle the files up into it and consolidating the free space at the end. Whilst the disk is compacting, we can see that there's no flashing cursor. 
and afterwards the disk should have only a single block of free space. So, with all that sorted, I can finally complete the functionality of the advanced tube interface by connecting up my PyTube Direct to the tube port on the right hand side of the AP5 and confirm that works OK. One thing to note here is that if you have a Pi 1 MHz connected, you do need to turn it on, otherwise the machine is very unreliable and tends to hang shortly after boot up. OK, so with this setup I've managed to combine the functionality of the Elk SD Plus One and the ATI with ABR into one physical cartridge, um, and that'll leave the other slot free on my Plus One for something else, which could be an AP3 or AP4 floppy disk interface, or it could even be the Elk Econet that we are working our way around to honestly. Um, I have lost two banks of uh, sideways RAM that would uh, come out of one of these two cartridges, um, but I do have a 32k RAM chip inside the uh, AP6, so that'll give me back two banks of uh, sideways RAM to load in some ad hoc sideways ROMs if I want them. Uh, now I could stop here, um, but there are a couple of things about the AP5 that uh, I think it's worth covering, and I'll do those now as a, a couple of bonus items at the end here. A lot of the discrete logic on the new AP5 is handled by a CPLD, a complex programmable logic device. I originally had problems with my AP5 when using it at the same time as the ELP Econet cartridge, as the hardware addresses it uses clash with those supported by the 1 MHz bus port, but fortunately the CPLD can be updated by loading on new firmware using a JTAG programmer. The firmware is written in a language called VHDL. Because the problem with the ELP Econet is only affected by reading and not writing data, and the only other device known to use the same addresses is the BeebSID, which needs only writes, David Banks produced an update to ignore reads to those addresses. Once that was changed, the updated VHDL can be synthesized to a new binary file. This takes a minute or so to generate and update the flash memory inside the CPLD, but once it is, it's ready to go whenever the cartridge is powered up. OK, so things are shaping up pretty well. We've got the AP5 working alongside the Elk Econet hidden behind there in the back slot. Um, but we do have quite a lot of height, um, in particular this Turbo MC cardboard sticking out of the uh, user port in the AP5. Um, well, recently James Watson came up with an idea to replace that um, with the SD card inside the Pi 1 MHz and get that working with MMFS. So we'll have a look at that now. In traditional MMFS, you have an MMC board with an SD card with a file called beep.mmb stored on it that holds all the virtual floppies. MMFS runs on the Electron and uses the user port to talk to the MMC board and directly read and write data from the SD card as the disks are accessed. With the Pi 1 MHz MMFS, you start with a Pi running a suitably up-to-date version of the Pi 1 MHz software and copy the beep.mmb file onto the same SD card. On boot up, the Pi 1 MHz will find that file and copy the whole thing into RAM. It's only about 100 MB and so easily fits into the Pi's memory. MMFS still runs on the Electron, but it accesses the file through a 256 byte page window in the gym memory area. Currently, however, any changes to the in-memory copy of the beep.mmb file are not copied back to the SD card, so any changes you make are lost on power off. It's still in development though, so hopefully an ability to trigger this will be added at some point. Another minor drawback is the um, separate SD card in the Turbo MMC board is useful for shuffling data backwards and forwards between your modern computer. Um, and it can be awkward getting at the SD card in your Pi 1 MHz if you put it in a box like I have, or perhaps you've got it in one of those under keyboard level shifters on the BBC Micro. But I can probably work around that by just inserting the Turbo MMC board when I need it, or perhaps even using Econet. But it's great to see the uh, Acorn community coming up with new ideas and develop them into uh, things. So, the new AP5 has allowed me to do exactly what I wanted it to, which is combine two cartridges into one and free up one of the slots in my plus one. Which sets us up nicely to have a look at the Elk Econet in a future video. Now, I do get lots of comments though with people saying that I'm kind of ruining the simplicity of the Electron by hanging all this stuff out the back of it, and I must say that I agree. Um, the Electron will always suffer from being uh, compared, unfortunately, to be the younger sibling of the BBC Micro and um, not looked at as a computer in its own right, which was uh, an inexpensive computer but was very powerful and had an excellent operating system. But unfortunately, excellent operating systems didn't sell computers in the early 80s. So if a bit of nostalgia with the Electron is what you're after, then you're probably better off just buying an Elk SD64, which is still excellent value for money. You can play a bit of Meteors and do a bit of basic or assembly language programming. So I think that's everything for today. I hope you found that interesting and maybe even useful. And see you next time.